an expert. Um, okay, so uh, this is a two-pronged attack. First of all, I would like to just tell you a little bit about some of the images we've chosen to be these prints. And then we'll jump into the new book briefly because it won't, it won't be out for another year and a half, basically. <laughs> Nothing strong. <laughs> except, except everything's been sketched over and over and over. So what you will see, if we're, if we're up for it, is a, a set of sketches that actually do lay out the structure of the book. Um, there's also a little video that I want you to see that the, Rock, the, the Northern Rockwell Museum has produced um, in anticipation of the exhibition, which will be built around the non-existent book. Um, imagine trying to plan as a museum person for an exhibition and have the space on your calendar and not have the book yet. So anyway, um, so if they look nervous, uh, when you bump into museum people, especially those of the sort of curatorial side of things, you now know why. Okay, um, let's start with exhibit item number, let's do the Colosseum first. Oh, and, um, obvious, has to be in this is, uh, this is one of the images from a book called Romantics, which is a, basically a pigeon's eye view <laughs> of Rome. Mm -hmm. So the pigeon flying around the Colosseum. Obviously, there's plenty of reference material from which to make an image like this, but the fact is, when it comes down to it, you have to figure it out and you have to draw it. Um, unless you're going to trace a photograph, which, which would be beside the, you know, would be meaningless. So uh, I, have, I don't know how many sketches of this view to get the arches right, get the proportions right, and so on and so forth. Um, but anyway, Colosseum. And um, up here, uh, via, uh, via Appia Antica, this is the ancient Roman road to the south, out of Rome, and it's lined with tombs. Now these tombs don't actually exist, but they're like the tombs that do exist. Um, again, it's, a, in a, it's an imagined place along the Appian Way. Um, with the appropriate vegetation, you need the pines and the cypress trees or whatever those are, um, and, and a few scattered ruins, and then the wonderful stone paving blocks that still are there, those of you who haven't been, and I'm sure most of you by now have, um, that contain the ruts of the wagon carts that travel back and forth between Rome and uh, the southern part of the country. Um, these are all, they're pen the original drawings are pen and ink drawing, and with a fountain pen, very much like, if not identical, to this one. This may be the pen. I don't. I don't. I get them mixed up now. But um, uh, anyway, it's sort of nice to sort of see these guys are larger than the book, and the book was pretty large. Um, let's just stay on room for a second and do. Take, let me take you through these two. Um, this is the uh, Piazza of Saint Ignazio. That's the Church of Saint Ignatius. Um, this is a church that needed a piazza that was a little different from other piazzas, apparently. So they actually carved out the corners of buildings that did exist and built some new buildings to create the symmetricality of this stage set. Great thing about this was that if you get tired of it, <laughs> you don't actually have to, uh, you know, get a new painting. You just turn it upside down. So leave enough wire on the back. Um, when you stand. This space now, while it is still a piazza, is also very much a parking lot. So when you go into the middle of the space, and if you do, you find yourself just doing this. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's compelling. And the sky is usually blue, and so on and so forth. But you do have to watch out for cars, is what I was getting to there. It's a little dangerous. Um, so it's probably safer to have an image like this <laughs> than to experience the real thing. Now this is, this is the Pantheon, and um, Again, one of those iconic Roman monuments built by Hadrian. 26-foot um, diameter oculus through which it rains and occasionally snows. The sun comes in, moves around the course of the building, the walls of the building during the course of the day. Uh, this is, um, because it's a pigeon's eye view in the book, the page is laid out like this. Because to the pigeon, it doesn't matter. Gravity is, you know, to be considered, but as often as it's considered, it's completely ignored because the pigeon will go where the pigeon wants to go. So imagine yourself being able to sort of move around a space like this as a pigeon 
without the traditional encumbrances of weight. Um, okay, this is unbuilding. This is done in 80, when was it done? 80, 80 something, maybe it was 80. Um, this is the story of the dismantling of the Empire State Building. This is an image from it. I wanted to start with a key image um, so that as I chipped away at the building, you would, and every five or six spreads, you get the next installment in the, in the removal of this structure. Why was it removed? Because it was purchased by a um, Middle Eastern client. They were an oil company looking for a building, new headquarters for the desert outside Riyadh. And um, they wanted something that already had a reputation. So it occurred to me that Empire State Building's got a reputation. <laughs> Maybe it's time for it to move along and create some open space <laughs> off Fifth Avenue. So what I had to do, and the reason I went through this ridiculous scenario, is that I want you to know how the building was built. But I didn't want to build it from the ground up, like cathedral and pyramid and castle. So I thought, I'll just take it down. It actually takes almost three times as long to remove it now than it did to build it in 1929 to 1930, 31. I mean, things have changed. There are more rules, there's OSHA. Um, there are all kinds of things. Um, people are more sensitive about falling blocks of limestone, chrome nickel steel trim, and steel beams. Um, so anyway, oh, these are, these are proposed, uh, when, when the book came out, those were proposed Philip Johnson buildings, very, you know, postmodern, want to be on the cutting edge with what's happening over around Madison Avenue and between Madison and Park. But this is, this is the, the star here. And in the background is the, uh, the World Trade Towers, which play a small role in the story. They were part of the deal. Um, and the deal was that in order to be given permission to buy the Empire State Building, the uh, customers, the clients, had to be willing to dismantle the World Trade Towers, which I personally found inhuman. So it's an odd feeling now to have suggested that, that possibility back in 1979, 80, but that's the reality. Um, the beginning, this is the very first drawing I did for Cathedral. Cathedral was the very first drawing, I, the very first book I did. This drawing was made on a small round table in a hotel room in uh, Amiens, north of Paris. It's the cathedral I went to see when I realized that if I was going to do a book about a cathedral, I should probably go and see one close up, rather than just reading about them and looking at pictures and so on. So I, I took my advance, uh, half of it, and went to Paris, flew to Paris, and uh, took the train to Amiens, and um, spent a week there in the hotel near the railway station. And they had a little restaurant, so I ate there, I slept there, I walked back and forth to the cathedral from the hotel. I walked around the city, went out every day and looked at it from a different point of view. But because I do not speak French, I never got to see those parts of the cathedral that would have helped me understand better um, the vaulting, roof construction, and things of that nature. It wasn't until we did the series for public television uh, many years later that I actually got up above the vaulting and climbed along the, you know, the outside of the walls and stood next to the stained glass above the uh, um, the tr not the transept, but the, uh, the aisles along the side of the nave. Um, so I have since learned everything, and I, I was okay. I was pretty much on target because there were, fortunately for me, some pretty good books around about uh, the, uh, the building of a Gothic cathedral. Anyway, that's how it started, and that's where all of these ultimately came from. Um, five years ago, six years ago, we did a new version of Cathedral and Castle as part of a book called Built to Last which also included mosque. Um, they wanted to do this, this set three all in one. And uh, the original request was very simple. They, this is my former publisher. Uh, they wanted my permission to um, have somebody colorize the art, basically, digitally, take the black and white drawings like that one, and throw color on it. And I explained to them that the reason there is so much, so much cross-hatching and so on and so forth here is because there is no color. We do one or the other. Um, the notion of filling an image with cross-hatching to create a sense of depth and shade and volume and then slapping color on top of it was just 
appalling, but apparently not um, in the sort of vocabulary of the publishing world in general. They would be happy to slap color on anything um, if they thought it would sell 10 more copies. So I said, I will do the book, um, but I will do it again from scratch. I'll start again, do it completely differently, improve the text where I thought there were problems, when we, there were some things I've learned that um, needed to be addressed. Not big things, but small things. And I think every time you have a chance to redo something, you want to make it better than the, the previous version. Now, it's a matter of opinion whether or not this image, I don't think this image is better than that image, it's different. This is more, this is bolder, this is uh, more attention getting, I think, and so on and so forth. Mostly because it's got 10,000 little black lines in it, which is always a winner. But this was fun to do, and, and to rework the construction process uh, with more knowledge. And to be able to, after, what, 30 years of drawing, be able to sort of show the construction process more carefully because I understood it more. I didn't have to fake anything. Um, made this one uh, ultimately a very satisfying project. It could have been a, a real drag, but it was, it was more fun. Um, anyway, that's what that's from. Um, Ignacio, this is from Mosque. This is the book I started officially about a week after September 11th when I realized that there was something missing from my collection of very sort of Western-oriented architecture. Um, and I thought, I want to tell the story of how the uh, you know people of the Islamic faith build and have built for a thousand years um, the structures in which they worship. And it's a fascinating structure. It's really fantastic uh, to begin to understand how you devise the space, what the space is needed for, how it's used. The dome is the roof, is the standard roof for all the buildings um, associated with not just the mosque, but the whole collection of buildings around it that include the tomb of the guy who paid for it, um, the madrasa, the soup kitchen, um, the baths, which will be built not only to be used by the people who run the, uh, the mosque and all its associated needs, but also the public. So there was a very much a sort of social conscience. And there are also two buildings that were built as kind of spec properties. This is in 1600. Um, so that, you know, if you need to sort of rent out space, we've got a space where you, so there were two money-making pieces of architecture that fit the style of the rest of the architecture, of the, the rest of the architecture, but were intended for unknown purposes, but they would raise funds to keep the mosque uh, going. And underground, Underground, the fourth book I did was actually uh, began after a conversation with my publisher uh, about something that he'd seen. Um, they were just um, on the Boston Common. They had a manhole. One of the manholes was open, and they were lowering boxes of things into this hole in the ground under the Boston Common. And we just were talking at lunch and began to sort of speculate on what else might be down there. Who knew there was a room full of boxes of perhaps <laughs> records from some town, from city office or something like that, some storage place. So I began to look into it and of course the foundations of buildings and all the utility systems, all things that we take for granted. And that's, I think it was probably with underground that I began to realize that that was going to be a major part of what drove the work I did. We get so used to seeing things that we no longer see them. Mm -hmm. We get so used to using them, that's a better way of putting it. Um, and that goes right up to the most recent technology, to iPhones and so on and so forth. As long as it works, it's fine. Um, so I have made, in, in many of the books, uh, an effort to try to clarify, to sort of expose uh, the inner workings of things. And Underground was the first version of that, the first real Something original, not just an old building being built. But that's, I mean, still, that was part of the same basic idea, but I hadn't realized that yet. So anyway, uh, this is um, from a street in Boston. I just removed the street. I took a photograph, and I have, of course, all the manhole covers and the truck, and a, a fire hydrant over there. And the rest of this, uh, the scene I invented, um, and of course, what happens when you start to extend from the manhole covers, um, you, you know, have to start thinking, well, what is down there? How big is that room? How big is that manhole? What goes on in the manhole? So anyway, that's what Underground is about. This is the image that sort of represents that. And finally, um, two images from a book called The Way We Work, which is the hardest book I've ever done because I got into this without knowing. 
anything about how I work. I mean, not a clue. So research has always been a big part of the process, but never so more than this one. I think four years, basically, four or five years on just research, just gathering information. Fortunately, the MacArthur grant um, came kind of in the middle of that when we were just about to shut off the lights. So, uh, it, you know, it allowed me to continue to work in the way I wanted to work, which is to get the information as accurate as possible and uh, finally produce the book. But we've got um, capillaries up here, and you're watching blood move in single file through the capillaries. The blood cells move in single That's not fiction, that's reality. And then the cells that wrap around like pancakes to sort of um, enclose the capillaries, and the muscles that wrap themselves around the capillaries to prevent a slowdown or, or, or you know, let the flow go. Um, and parasites, not parasites, but parasites, cells that wrap themselves around to sort of further stabilize the structures because they're pretty, um, pretty fragile. Anyway, that's capillaries. Um, double page spread. And um, the wonderful hand, the good old hand. I mean, sort of have to pay tribute to the thing that I use all the time. And um, so it's sort of a series of fingers that from just bones to bones being connected and, and the, uh, the capsules wrapped to the tendons being laid in over the bones, to the tendons being wrapped, and to this, um, to the gift of the rose, to the giver of the ring. And um, so there are stories in here all the time, little things, um, little important things. So anyway, that's the way things work. I mean, how, how many of us really, unless something goes wrong and we are forced to become really knowledgeable about this thing that suddenly is becoming a threat, how many of us really know, you know what's going on in there? So this was, this was an important thing for me to do. It was an exhausting project. But, um, and do I remember everything that I researched and looked at then? No. Um, but I know where to find it now. And my hope is always that the illustrations will prod the brain to sort of uh, make those connections again um, for things I don't remember. Um, but and anyway. That's been the joy of making these books, is that you, I'm a student. First and foremost, I'm a student. And if I'm a good student, then I can probably be a decent teacher. But if I stop being a student, I'd be a terrible teacher. Uh, so I remain a student. I remain open to all sorts of information and ideas. I find a way, I hope, of make of you know, I find an excuse, first of all, for learning about them, but then I, I hope I find uh, some kind of a story that will engage a reader, um, that they will find the story compelling enough to want to turn the pages. And when you come out at the end, you've not only sort of seen a story evolve and, and be you know, resolved, but you come away with information about things that perhaps you're very familiar with but hadn't really thought about. Maybe I've shown you something in a slightly different way that makes you a little more appreciative or, or even admire it of some of the stuff that we, uh, we take for granted. So anyway, that's, what, that's why the prints were selected. They sort of are. There's nothing here yet from the way things work. Um, perhaps down the road there will be a few images from that book. But anyway, this is to get the, the process started. And um, so you've been introduced to them. The, the, these other things on the wall, I don't know what they are, but they're not for sale. Um, so anyway, these are upstairs. So, um, we have the, um, can we have this video now, do you think? Is that, is that an easy do, an easy fix? Yep. I want to show you a little video produced by the incredibly optimistic Norman Rockwell Museum <laughs> for the exhibition. We have to keep changing the date, um, but I think we probably have a date that's more or less viable now. So. The odd thing about this book is it did not begin as a book about a ship. The most modern, the most beautiful, the fastest passenger ship in the world, the SS United States. It began as a, a book about invention and the notion of one thing leading to another. At the age of 10, my mother and brother and sister and I took the ship from Southampton in England to, um, to come to the United States. I only wanted to see, as a 10-year-old, the Empire State Building. It never occurred to me that I was on something of approximately the same size. Um, and that was equally significant in its own way. So it's the ship's story. It's my story a little bit, but it's also William Francis Gibbs's story. The man whose vision it was to spend the rest of his life 
somehow involved with ships. The ship is still with us. It's still, you know, docked in Philadelphia, and there has been this ongoing battle to save it. It's a beautiful object, and it takes us back to another time, to a time when you saw huge things being shaped and sculpted in a way that would allude to their speed and their prestige in a sense. I mean, this ship was designed to be in sort of the flagship of the United States. It was time, perhaps, to have a flagship. And this is just, this is a beauty. It's really got to be a human story in the end. It's, a, it's about people and what they're capable of. But there's all this sort of technology draped along the way, which is how I kind of hold it together, and which is what sucks me in in the first place. So those, those, are, the, those are the parts of it, and those are the, the sort of characters, human and non-human, who, who come together to create this um, odd book.